If Marco Polo had journeyed to this place, he might have written, it is a wondrous city at the foot of an embankment they call the mountain. The inhabitants thereof carry curious little caskets made of metal containing foodstuffs. They have many strange customs. They are not allowed to start their tasks until they perform a ceremony which causeth a curious sound. They use wondrous devices unknown to us. But to our greatest astonishment, we found there scholars of renown seeking to derive knowledge from the deeds of verminous beasts. Well, and this, this one is, uh, I guess, an experiment on the uh, effects of psychological stress on behavior. We first train the rats um, to press a lever, and we reinforce them with food. And they sit in the box in here and press. It might be useful to people who are working with humans and are interested in stress. Not that it'll give us any answers about humans, but it'll give them ideas about how humans might work. Do you ever mull over the fact that people are doing exactly the same as rats, pushing bars to get rewards? Oh yes, I think this is one of the things that really got me interested in this area originally. in the city long ago used the quaint phrase, we want bread and roses too. traveled as far as Marco Polo to get to the city. Some of them came in search of paradise. They found bread. They looked for the roses. Saturday midnight, the Black Forest Restaurant. Curious that in the heart of the new city of their hopes, they should try to recreate the home they left, even though the picture in their minds is a fairy tale land. The 
Vasetti's coat of arms shows a beehive on the shield. It bears the words commerce, prudence, industry, and a motto, I advance. The city produces seven million tons of steel a year. This man works as a blower on the blast furnace. He came from Germany in search of fortune. He's only once been to the Black Forest restaurant. He's settled for a treasure he's gathered together at home. Uh, yes, it takes your mind off uh, your problems of life. Now, I myself would say I don't have uh, problems that are unsolvable, but uh, still, it, uh, it takes your mind off and you relax. I was struck by many women that appear on stamps. There might be many men appearing on stamps too, but they are just statesmen or politicians or engineers or scientists or so. But uh, I found that there are many beautiful women uh, appear on stamps from time to time. So I thought it would be nice to uh, start a little collection of beautiful women of the world. I came to the conclusion that uh, there is no complete happiness, that uh, no one is perfect, that uh, even if you don't want to admit it, that uh, you always have uh, faults, errors, you make mistakes. There is no country that uh, renders you the uh, utmost of happiness. Uh, wherever you look, there are advantages and disadvantages, and uh, I don't think you get out of it. There is no paradise in the world. thousand people in the city. They come here from every corner of the world. Ukrainians, Italians, Greeks, Germans, Serbs, Poles, Slovaks, Dutch. And they all come looking for something, not necessarily spiritual. For many, it's happiness enough to have champions to fight in their name, even though most of their warriors are mercenaries.
tumult and the shouting dies, the captains and the kings depart, the production lines go on forever. Some people try to make out that God is dead. God is not dead. You know why I know? I talked to him today. Hallelujah. And I know he's still alive. And God will heal you. I said God will heal you if you have an ounce of faith. I've been in hospitals long before I ever had known anything about the healing ministry. But friends, when I had a kidney stone the size of a good-sized marble, they operated twice and they sent me home with my kidney stone. And I told the doctor, I says, I read in the Bible about a very precious stone. I says, his name is Jesus. He was the cornerstone. Hallelujah. And I says, this is a job for Jesus and not for you. He didn't like me very well. But do you know what happened? God delivered me from my kidney stone and it didn't take a doctor. I was told that Smith Wigglesworth, a great man of God in England, had a kidney stone the size of a robin's egg. And he got desperate before God. And God broke that kidney stone in three pieces. And it came away by itself. You know something? I said if God can do that for Smith Wigglesworth, he can break Elmer Gerber's kidney stone in two pieces or in three pieces or whatever he wants. Do you know that God broke that kidney stone in two pieces? I have part of it tonight in my safe. I thank God that God answers prayer. I was in the selling business for 25 years. But tonight, I'm in the business of giving it away free. It's absolutely free. The word of God and the plan of salvation cannot be purchased with money. It is only through faith. Do you have that faith tonight? Praise God. So have I. May the Lord bless you real good. Number 368. in Ukrainian say, Lord, have mercy upon us. There are people who say, the city is a great machine. It exists only to make more machines. some in the city who seek the key to the whole of human existence in a universe they see working as a mechanism. Everything works by the stars. Everything is influenced by the stars. Our whole life, our planets, different, all different ones are influenced by stars and that's called astrology. And this works for you? It works, supposed to work for everybody. If you can use it, if you can use it to your own good, good for you. If you don't, sometimes uh, you make mistakes. We all make mistakes, but 
You try again. Of course. I figured if I figured the right day, the right time, and the right minute, I could might make that fortune. Sometimes it's luck. They call it luck, but they don't know if the stars were at the right point at the same time. Everything was to one point that made that that made him make that move, the right move at the right time. The clockmaker came to the city from Romania many years ago. He's had his disappointments. He's never given up his search. Do you ever dream of clocks? No. Once a while. Sure. What happens? What happens in your dreams of clocks? Well, you see an odd clock, so it's different. All the wheels are different the other way and cut different, and then you give you an idea that uh, there is such a thing, uh, clocks made by people. They get a dream and you make them up according. shift will end just after sunrise. Who can blame her if in the night she sometimes dreams the impossible dreams? A voice saying, you are the fairest of them all. The quarterback club meets to cross-examine the candidates for Queen. My name is Bob Garside, chairman of this contest on behalf of the Tarkin Quarterback Club. Welcome to all the mothers and friends. Do you go steady? I don't go steady. I go out with a fellow. You're 17? Yes, I am. Do you go steady? Um, I haven't gone steady yet. I've gone out with uh, a few boys for, I think, three months was the longest. Not steadily. <laughs> Just okay. I don't think I'm missing anything. <laughs> <laughs> what type of man would you care to marry? Your ideal man. Well, but uh, he'd have to be intelligent. He'd have to be good-looking, in my estimation. He'd have to have characteristics that I liked. He'd have to be a good dancer. He'd have to be sincere. He wouldn't be phony. Can't stand people who are phony. Um, he'd have to have a very good job, and I would like to go up the ladder of success with him.
In the city are lonely men who came to make it a paradise. One is now a commissionaire at the hospital. I don't regret ever being a party member. I don't regret it because the party has given me a great many things. And, uh, and I'm not talking about Stalinism. It's given me a, a, a picture of society. It has connected up that picture from the very foundations of the earth, as it were, to the economic development of today. I had pinned everything I had on that philosophy. And that philosophy turned sour with Stalin, and I went my own way, but I pursued the philosophy of socialism. I had learned, I had read and I had learned from a man like Bakarin, for example. And I thought he was a terrific thinker. And I had read his writings, and it, it convinced me that he was a, a great man. And then, uh, when I found that Stalin had spurned him and, uh, and uh, looked upon him as a, as a preacher, I, I just couldn't understand that. Such a man, such a mind, such a real champion of socialism, dubbed a traitor. And it hurt me to the point that I could no longer go with them. I had to step aside and do a little thinking, do a little thinking before I could proceed. And that's what I did. And do you know that since I stepped aside and was no longer uh, a party member, uh, I found that my thinking was released. And I could make decisions according to my own logic. And I think I have been a much better man since then because I have no longer to wait for the opinions of other people. I can form my own opinions. And that doesn't mean to say that I have deviated one iota from socialist thoughts or drive to uh, socialist ends. Men like myself we were misfits in society after that, to some extent. We belonged nowhere. We had no spiritual home, as it were. You see, you have to have... A man has to have some mental allies, as it were. Then it leaves you, it leaves like a poor man who has a strong religion, for example, that believes absolutely in a deity and a doctrine of religion and find it is all a myth. But you know that human beings must advance. And you can't give up totally. See, there has to be another way. The karate studio opens every day at 5 p.m. What we're trying to do here is uh, everybody's trying to clear their mind. It's like a religion. I'd say karate is more of a religion than a sport. During the day, uh, one of the instructors works as a fireman. You've got to, uh, you've got to feel karate. You can't just, you can't just go and practice it every day and and do your, your, your sequins, your punches, your kicks, and practice all your techniques. You've got to put something more into it. It's got to go a bit deeper than that. In karate, you go deep, and you've got to have deep concentration. And this is how you've got to practice. You've got to always be in this kind of emotional state. And this is where you, you start to bring in sort of zen. Now, we don't go that deeply into zen, but uh, like what zen actually is, or Basically, what it is is very deep concentration. 
Uh, you, you try to take your mind and, and put it into what you're doing. Your mind is actually right there in your fist. This man is a steel worker. He operates a punch press. You might say I'm a fanatic in it now. Not as much as a fanatic as I would like to be, but I'm a fanatic. As much as I, well, as much as I can possibly do, I do. What would you you have done if you hadn't found it? Kept looking, I guess. Looking for something. And it draws us close together. This is one thing. Uh, you, you sweat together, you suffer together, mm -hmm. and for some reason there's a friendship, but a very close friendship rises out of these. Uh, you're bound, extremely bound together. And maybe this is what I needed, friends. Work to me is a way of getting money. I put my eight hours in, I get paid for that, a check comes in, I can live on it. Karate for me is a sport, passion, and excitement. Next, for instance, take a still lake. You consider this as your mind. Now, if you were to throw a pebble or a rock into the water, you cause ripples, right? Well, this is how we explain it. Now, if the moon is shining, this is using your eyes, if the moon is shining on the lake, you can see it clearly. Now, if the water is distorted, you can't see it clearly, see? And this is, this is where we use our, our, our mind okay, when you are fighting. When you are sparring with an, another opponent, uh, a well-trained karate student should be able to spar and think, think of nothing and see nothing but the man he's, his opponent. You're always reaching for, for more and more knowledge in one way or another. But uh, it, it seems like uh, there's always a goal beyond. For 500 years in villages of Eastern Europe at Christmas time, they've sung pre-Devo. What is this day of wonder?
even Christmas isn't allowed to upset the core of the city's existence. The blast furnaces have to keep going, the stream has to keep flowing. Our civilization is built upon steel. Right in the midst of it all, they managed to have a party. It was timed to begin at 1 p.m. It took 100 buses, shuttling between the mill and a shopping center, to bring all the guests, workers, and their families. 25,000 people were expected to pass through before the closing bell at 5 o'clock. There were 15,000 gift packages for the kids, 8,000 for the grown-ups. For such a large party, it was managed with extreme efficiency. It was all set up and gone through and taken down again without upsetting the schedule of the mill by a minute. And a very, very, very kiss. Oh my, oh my. I swear there, we should tear out all these lights. And with eyes like that and a smile like that, we could brighten the place right up again, couldn't we? A Merry Christmas and a very, very Christmas to you. And a very, Merry Christmas to you. And a Merry Christmas to you. A Merry Christmas to you. And a very, very Merry Christmas to you. Trevor, how are you? Well, Santa sure is happy to hear that. And are you having a good time here? Did you see the clowns down the other end? Well, Santa's going to get down there. He's going to see them too because, oh, they say they're so much fun, aren't they? It's a marvelous process. Things made of steel, when they get old, are crushed and baled into packages as scrap and used to make more steel. It used to be the Iron Age, but iron was limited in its uses. It was brittle and hard to work. A century ago, they found a practical way of transmuting iron. 
They burn out the impurities at temperatures that reach up to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And depending on the amount of carbon they add, transform it into the metal of all virtues, stronger and tougher than iron, malleable enough to be rolled into razor blades. It was Christmas Eve. Three more hours and the shift would be over. The date was actually January 5th. Christmas Eve for thousands in the city who go by the old calendar. The tree is an oak. For thousands of years, pagan Serbian tribes worshipped the oak as the symbol of the unknown god. The tree is no longer an unknown god to be propitiated. It is the tree of life. Everyone will take home a branch or twig to keep in remembrance of this night. It's the symbolic promise of joy, of serenity.
We'll just get married. That's all. No, you can can that idea, Charlie. <laughs> you want to get married? No, I don't want to get married. Why, Why? You got lots of money? You got lots of money. We'll get married. Do you want to get married for money? Lights green. <laughs> <laughs> A week before the Serbs celebrated Christmas in the church hall, other people of the city started out to celebrate New Year's Eve. No, tonight is going to be a night of all nights. Well, I'm going to make a complete fool of myself. I'll tell you right now. I'm going to let go. I always let go on New Year's, so. Sure, why not? It's the end of the year. The city has 227 churches, four synagogues, two cathedrals, and this little church, 
built by the Serbs 50 years ago. This is Christmas Day. is the rebirth of the spirit of the living they look for. city in search of a better life, but they did not come as pilgrims to a shrine. They brought their shrines and sacred objects with them. Christos se rodi. 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 Christos se